Good morning, all of you. A warm welcome to our Zoom webinar organized by GMOA and Society for Health Research and Innovation on Diagnostic Evolution of Chest Pain and Prevention of Ischemic Heart Disease. Kindly mute your microphone and turn off your camera during the presentation and use the chat box to clear your doubts at the end of this session. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Amila Valavata, consultant cardiologist, currently attached to the District General Hospital, Amelia. Over to you, sir. Thank you for that kind introduction and very good morning to all of you. So in my presentation, I'll be discussing about diagnostic evaluation of chest pain and especially acute pain. And then later on, I'll be talking to you on prevention of ischemic heart disease, which will be an overview. So why is chest pain a challenge? It's a challenge because it is a symptom which could result in death. Also, it is a potentially a medical emergency in the sense that time really matters. So you have to be quick in making your diagnosis and initiating necessary therapy. On the other hand, benign chest pain is much more commoner than this uh, significantly dangerous diagnosis. So you have to develop your skill in filtering out the threatening causes of chest pain from benign causes. So for that, you need to develop a bit of practice and knowledge and skills um, in your clinical practice. So these are some of the causes of chest pain which could result in death, out of which the most common is acute coronary syndrome followed by pulmonary embolism, aortic dissection, esophageal rupture, pneumothorax, and in some cases, pneumonia. What are the benign causes that we could think of? You have your musculoskeletal problems arising from the, the ribcage structures, costochondritis, pain coming from your intercostal muscles, etc. And then you have your the gastric esophageal reflux disease, esophagitis, uh, pericarditis, and pleurisy or pain coming from the pleural structures uh, causing chest pain. And sometimes most often you get patients coming with chest pain and you can't pinpoint and say this is due to a particular cause and you call it a non-specific chest pain. So most of your patients coming with chest pains has benign causes. However, our priority would be to filter out these benign causes and pick up the life-threatening ones presenting with chest pain. The most important thing I would like to reiterate is when you are encountered with a patient, have a little bit of patience just to listen to the patient's history without interrupting him at least for a minute or so. Because that will give you a good overall picture of the patient's complaint and will prevent uh, any undue bias in making your judgment. Because if you interrupt, sometimes that important information might never come back again, might never be revealed again. So it's important just to listen to the patient, not for long, maybe for a minute or so. Then you start elaborating, you ask your questions and pick up and make your diagnosis. So let's talk about uh, acute coronary syndrome. So for that, you have to make a diagnosis of angina. So to diagnose angina, we use certain clinical characteristics. What is the location of the pain? Where is the, what is the nature of the pain? And how long does it last? And etc. So regarding the location of pain, in those with acute coronary syndrome, uh, the pain, uh, could be 
most in most patient could be central retrosternal area however this pain could spread or start from the epigastrium it could radiate to the neck the lower jaw sometimes even the face and then you have your arms both sides the left arm as well as the right arm and sometimes it could spread to the back of the chest so you could have a patient coming with pain starting in the center of the chest and radiating to these areas or you could have the vice versa pain starting in some other areas as specified and spreading back to the chest or sometimes you have just a pain in these one of these areas maybe the neck or the jaw or the arms and never have spreading onto the chest so 81 of the patterns could be compatible with acute coronary syndrome and this particular pain is poorly localized that you can't pinpoint put your finger and you know say this is the particular point of pain it's a poorly localized spread out pain and most important thing is this pain would last longer than 20 minutes so if you have patients coming with this type of a pain you have to first thing is it acute coronary syndrome and the quality of the pain is described in different ways by patients many would describe it as tightening or heavy or pressure sensation whereas another group will describe it as a burning pain and some would call it aching so the the way the patient would describe vary from patient to patient but it's a poorly localized pain Uh, in one of the specified areas as we've already discussed lasting beyond 20 minutes so if you got any that kind type of a pattern in any patient you have to think of first think of acute coronary syndrome and the other associated symptoms could be sweating nausea vomiting etc so then you go on to the examining examination and here one of the most important thing i would like to point out is to just to look at the overall appearance of the patient is the patient ill looking and in agony or is he despite uh, the complaints of pain looking well because some patients present to you because of the agony of the pain whereas some just presents to you because they are more concerned about the pain although they are not in real agony so these Um, so although this is a bit subjective these are important things uh, to look at and get it into your practice then you go on to assess the hemodynamics the pulse blood pressure especially blood pressure of both arms and then you auscultate the precordial area looking for certain abnormalities then we'll go on to our investigations the most important thing is the ecg it's quick and easy to to and we should do it within the within 10 minutes of presentation and if, when you find any abnormalities if Not available well. you should always ask for all the ecgs then compare and look for new change in making your diagnosis here i want to highlight one fact that a single normal ecg will not exclude acute coronary syndrome you can have a patient coming with chest pain and it could even be st elevation mi and the first ecg may be normal because the ecg changes could lag behind pain in some patients so it's important that we if the history is suggestive to do to do another ecg in about half an hour and recheck so these are we are going going to go through a few ecgs uh, to uh, make you more familiar with uh, the abnormalities that you would anticipate so this is a patient with a normal ecg so we look at few things one thing is we are going to look at these uh, t waves then we are going to look at the st segment and the shape of the qrs complex so in this patient you would find that the t waves are nice and upright in all the leads the st segment is at the baseline and the qrs complexes are normal so this is a normal ecg so in this patient what can you see you could see that in the anterior precordial leads you would find fairly deep t 
T inversions and these T inversions are quite symmetrical and present in V1 to V5. So this is a patient who is likely to be having a acute coronary syndrome if the patient comes with a compatible history. So what do you think about this ACG? Again, you would find some T inversions. So here you find the T inversions are mostly in the lateral leads, you know, V5, V6, and here in lead one and lead two. So these are mostly in the lateral read. And if you look at the shape of the T waves, these are asymmetrical T inversions. It's not, there's no symmetry in it. So if your patient doesn't give a history compatible with acute coronary syndrome, you don't have to rush into the making of making the diagnosis of ACS here because uh, just because the T is inverted, because the pattern of the T wave is different. And in the absence of a compatible history, you don't have to rush into that particular diagnosis. However, if your patients come with the history suggestive of ACS, then again, you should look at it differently. So we will move on to another ECG. So what do you think about this particular ECG? So if you look at this ECG, you would find that the ST segments are abnormal in many leads. So if you look at V6, V5, V4, V3 lead, um, AVF, the ST segments have depressed. So it's likely, highly likely that this patient has an acute coronary syndrome. So taking a look at another ECG, the patient's counsel has pain, and you are encountered with this ECG. So what is the striking abnormality here? So this is lead three and lead AVF, you would find the ST segments have gone up. So uh, it's a ST elevation MI. And if you look at the opposing leads for the inferior leads, the opposing leads, leads are the anterior and the lateral leads. So in the anterior leads, you would find that the ST segments have gone down a bit and we call it ST depression in the opposing lead or reciprocal changes in the opposing leads. So this patient has an acute inferior ST elevation myocardial infarction. So what do you think about this particular ECG? Again, similar type of an ECG you find in the inferior leads, lead three and lead AVF, the ST segments have gone up and reciprocal changes in V1 to V3. Anything else that you could appreciate in this ECG? That is the rhythm. So if you look at this CCG, the QRS complexes are marching separately and the P waves are marching separately and there is no relation from P to this QRS complex. So there is AV dissociation that is a complete heart block, which is quite common in patients coming with inferior ST elevation MIs. Another ECG patient with chest pain, you find in the anterior leads, the ST segments have gone up and the opposing inferior lead, you would find the different ST change, that is ST depressions, the reciprocal changes, and this patient appears to be having an acute anterior ST elevation myocardial infarction. So what are the how does the ECG evolve in ST elevation MIs? So these are the changes which appears on a typical case. So when the patient starts to having MI, the very first ECG could even be normal. As time moves on, first thing you would notice here is that the height of the T wave has gone taller. We call the hyperacute T waves. Then you would find the ST segment going up here resulting in ST elevation. So in typical case, this would be convex upwards. And times moves further, you start developing the Q waves and the ST segments return back to baseline. However, I would like to reiterate one important feature here that this particular things like you're having a convex upwards pattern and the chest pain being 
localized to one vascular territory and the presence or absence of reciprocal changes, these are not necessarily has to be there in every case. You can have a ST elevation MI with, uh, without any of these typical features. So these are things that you need to be familiarized uh, with. However, don't take one particular feature and say this is this can't be ACS. If your patient has a history, the pain is suggestive and you got ST elevation, always think this is a STEMI and try to confirm that particular diagnosis than taking one particular feature and trying to rule it out. So this is an interesting ACG. So what are the abnormalities you see here? You find the patients come with chest pain and you find in the inferior leads, ST segments have depressed L3 AVF. In the anterior leads, what are the abnormalities that you would see? You find the height of the T wave is a little bit higher. So if the patient has a old ECG, you may be able to appreciate the height of in his normal ECG and this wing, this is a hyperacute T wave. And if you find the STs, STs have not gone up, but it is a little depressed and there is upsloping ST depressions, it's slanted. So this is a particular uh, particularly important ECG because this actually represents anterior ST elevation MI. Uh, not a common pattern to be seen in most cases. Most anterior stemis, you would find the STs to go up and the inferior lead ST segments to depress. But in this patient, you have the inferior ST depression, the anterior, you only have this upsloping ST depressions and hyperacute T waves. This is a equivalent to an anterior ST elevation MI. We call it the D winter pattern. D winter pattern, and you have to actually either thrombolize this patient or to send him for a uh, primary PCI or emergency angioplasty. And you basically would be treating this patient as a STEMI. Although you don't find ST elevation, this is a typical appearance, inferior ST depressions, hyperacute tubes, and upsloping ST depressions. So let's look at, is uh, STEMI the only cause for the ST elevations? The answer is no, because there are many other causes, including benign varieties, which could present with ST elevation, ST elevation in the ECG. So you always have to tell you is the history of the patient in making the diagnosis rather than just looking at the ECG abnormalities. So in this patient, you would find that there are some ST elevations in the lateral leads and some of the anterior leads also. Then the shape of the ST elevation is concave upwards. Again, don't rely on that particular feature alone to say whether it's a STEMI or not. But you find the ST elevation in the lateral leads, there are no reciprocal changes. Uh, so it could be a benign variety. However, if your patient has a history suggestive of ACS, you know, pain, burning or a tightening pain in the area that we specified uh, before, and then you have to think, okay, this could still be an ST elevation MI, although the ECG appearance is not typical. Whereas in a patient's come with a, you know, non-cardiac type of a chest pain, which may look like muscular, you know, pain was on breathing, movements, and uh, localized to one particular point. And then you think, okay, this could be a benign variety. This, this is a typical appearance of benign early repolarization, which is seen in uh, some people and it's not a ST elevation MI. So you have to tell you with the history and the ECG and you can appreciate that this is probably not a STEMI because there are no reciprocal changes uh, and the ST elevation, you know, you have this slurred uh, appearance here and the ST elevation pattern is not typical and if the history is also not telling with ACS, then you could easily make a diagnosis of benign early repolarization here. So what do you think about this patient? So you find in this patient, the ST elevations have been, are there in most of the leads, except AVR and lead three. In all other leads, there is ST elevation. So this ST elevation is not confined to one vascular territory. So if it's a right coronary artery uploader, you get changes in the inferior leads. Anterior, left anterior descending artery uploader, you get in the anterior leads. But you find here the ST elevation in the anterior leads and some of the inferior leads. So, so more than one vascular territory, uh, 
so it could be uh, uh, a course other than a ST elevation MI. And also another feature that I would like to highlight here, look at this segment. This is the PR segment. So this is the PR segment and this is the isoelectric line in the CCG. You find the PR segment is depressed. So PR depression and ST elevation is a feature of pericarditis. Although the PR segment is depressed, depressed in most of these leads where there is ST elevation in AVR, this particular lead, the PR segment goes, tends to go up high. It's called PR elevation in AVR and the PR depression in other leads along with this uh, type of ST elevation not confined to one vascular territory. It's likely that this patient has pericarditis. Again, go back to and listen to the patient's history and make sure that, that the history is not telling with ACS because if the history is telling with ACS, your priority again would be to see whether you are to make sure that you are not missing a stem. So this is another course of benign, uh, sorry, not benign. It's another course for the ST elevation. So here you find little bit of ST elevation in the V1 and V2, the anterior leads. And this ST elevation is slanted. This what we call cowed up ST elevation. And there is a partial right band like RSR pattern in this ECG. This is what we call Brugada syndrome, which is a channelopathic process. Could give rise to, rarely could give rise to arrhythmias. And it's another uh, presentations where you would find ST elevation in the ECG due to a different course. So that's your Brugada syndrome. Then we are going to discuss about another important thing about left bundle branch block in those presenting with chest pain. So you diagnose LBB in this ECG because there is M pattern in, a, in lead one as well as in lead six and the QRS is complex is a broader, broader than three small scales. And uh, in V1 to V3, the QRS complex are downward. And in the lateral lead, you find the M pattern and it's a uh, broad complex. So with LBB, it's quite normal to find few millimeters of ST elevation in the anterior leads, as you can see here. So if you take one of these leads, this QRS complex is, is in downward direction whereas ST elevation is upwards. So we call this discordant ST elevation, discordant ST elevations. So few millimeters of discordant ST elevation is quite normal in LBB. However, if the this ST elevation is beyond five millimeters, that is more than one large square, that could be significant. So if discordant ST elevation to be significant, you need to be having that for more than five millimeters. If you would find any ST elevation in this lead where the QRS complex is upright, even one millimeter is significant. We call that concordant ST elevation. So that's what we are going to apply when we make a diagnosis of STEMI in LBB. So this is called the Garbosa criteria. If you find any ST elevation of even one millimeter in the same direction as the QRS complex, uh, it is significant. Uh, whereas in the opposite direction, the discordant ST elevation has to be more than five millimeters for you to think of uh, a STEMI. Similarly, similar to concordant ST elevation, if you have even one millimeter of ST depression in the anterior lead where the QRS complexes are downward, that is also uh, taken as significant in making a diagnosis. So look at this CCG. Again, broad QRS complexes, similar to LBB pattern here, and here you see the bit of LBB type pattern, downward complexes V1 to V3, but here you find the ST elevations are there and it is quite higher, quite taller. So this is discordant ST elevation more than five millimeters. And similarly, look at these leads, uh, there is ST elevation in the same direction as the QRS, so concordant ST elevation. So this is LBB, um, a patient with LBB having a STEMI. So that is different from this particular ECG. You can see concordant ST elevation as well as very tall discordant ST elevation. 
So we talked a lot about uh, ECG changes. Then we are going to talk a bit about um, the cardiac biomarkers or troponin. So mostly uh, we are using troponins because it is more specific and sensitive than other markers like myoglobin and uh, uh, CKMB. Uh, so unless your patient has ST elevation where the diagnosis is immediately clear, in all other patients we are going to use troponins for risk stratification and triage of our patients. So this is the how the behavior of the cardiac markers over time. So you find the myoglobin, the red color, and the CKMB levels return to baseline uh, after the initial write quite early, whereas troponin, if found elevated, would return to baseline over about a week. So what type of troponins are we using now? So those days we use, you know, conventional troponins where you would do a troponin, wait for six hours, do a troponin, and if positive, you make a diagnosis. If negative, you exclude. That's what we had those days. Those are the uh, conventional troponins which are available, and still that is what is available in most of these um, the outpatient departments where they use a strip or a dipstick to, uh, to clarify. Those are conventional troponins. But nowadays we are using highly sensitive troponin. So what's the difference? So if you look at this chart, this is the troponin level of a patient with a myocardial infarction. So these are the baseline levels or the normal levels. So that is the onset of the myocardial infarction. And you should find over time, there's an exponential rise of troponin levels as time moves on. So when we use the conventional troponins, um, it could only pick up troponins above a certain level. Now, this is the, the cutoff point. If you use conventional troponin, this is the cutoff point. It could pick up it as positive. However, the diagnosis of myocardial infarction, the definition is if the troponin is higher than the 99th percentile of normal people, it is good enough to diagnose MI. So if we use conventional troponins, we could miss out a certain number of patients who have mild degree of troponin elevation because it's not sensitive to pick up these patients. On the other side, you have to wait for about six hours to do a troponin because if you've done a troponin, the conventional one here, you would come as falsely negative. So you can't make early diagnosis with conventional troponins. Uh, you have to wait for about six hours. On the other side, it will uh, not pick up certain patients with mild troponin rise. So hence came the highly sensitive troponin. So this is your highly sensitive troponin. It could pick up even normal levels of troponins and quantify. So that is what we are going to use now. So with highly sensitive troponins, you can pick up almost all the cases. So very high sensitivity. On the other side, you can use it early to detect this level of troponin. So diagnosis can be made early. You don't have to wait for six hours. Uh, if you are using highly sensitive troponins. So early diagnosis, higher specificity. However, when we are using highly sensitive troponins, we are using two levels in most patients, you know, two assays uh, spaced by about uh, three hours. And then we are going to confirm a dynamic rise and uh, to confirm the diagnosis. So how are we going to do it? So this flow chart will tell you how to use highly sensitive troponins. So if your patients comes with chest pain and you do a highly sensitive troponin, if the troponin comes very high, like this level, uh, the, the kit will specify what is very high, high level. If that goes up above that level, even a one troponin is good enough to make your diagnosis the highly sensitive, with highly sensitive troponins. But if your value comes below that specified very high value, somewhere in this range, you always want to do two troponin assays spaced by about three hours and to confirm that there's a dynamic rise to confirm the diagnosis of MI. So that's what we are going to use. So in this one, if you can't see chest pain, if the patient comes with chest pain and you do troponin, troponin is very high, you can straight away 
make a diagnosis. For example, in the assays that we used in our hospital, the cutoff point for very high value is 100. So if the value comes with 100 with uh, patient comes with chest pain, you know, we are not going to do a second test because it's very high. If the history is compatible, we are going to confirm and manage it as a mine. Whereas if the troponin is only mildly elevated, somewhere in this range, we are going to do a second test in about three hours and assess the difference. And your kit will say that the leaflet will say this is the difference of the dynamic change, which we take as significant. If that, if that change is there, with uh, if the troponin initially in this range going up a bit, um, in the second assay, we are going to diagnose MI. Or similarly, if the first troponin is negative, and the second troponin is higher. Again, the difference is significant. We are going to diagnose an MI. However, in those it coming presenting late, for example, coming after six hours, if one troponin is negative, it is unlikely that the second troponin is going to be positive because the patient has come late. If there is any rise, um, it has to be there even in the first troponin. So. If your patients come with chest pain, if the troponin is negative, if the late present a single troponin is highly sensitive troponin is enough, we don't have to repeat. But if the patient comes early, even if the troponin is negative, you have to repeat in three hours, again, look for the change. So this is what we have in our hospital. The very high value we take as 100. So if something is above 100, one single assay is enough to confirm the diagnosis. We call it rule in that is making the diagnosis. If, however, if the troponin is, uh, you know, patients comes early, either the troponin first one is very low, below the 99 percentile or mildly elevated, we have to do a second troponin. And to look for that uh, delta or the difference value here, it specifies as 10. So the first value is 25, second value is uh, 45. It is the difference is more than 10. So you can make a diagnosis of MI. Similarly, if the first value is, you know, 15, second value is comes at 40, the difference is 25. Again, you can make a diagnosis of MI. However, if your patients comes, you know, late presenter, say coming in about 10 hours, one troponin is less than 90, then you don't have to repeat it. You can straight away say, no need to repeat another troponin. It's not an uh, myocardial infarction. So here, one key point in using highly sensitive troponin is what we want to make sure is uh, either to make an early diagnosis or to exclude it as a MI and to, you know, uh, put the patient, stratify the patient as a low risk patient so that you can make discharge planning. So that's the important. So uh, the highly sensitive troponin will not miss out a patient. So which what we call a negative predictive value. That means if your troponin comes as negative, you should be comfortably say this is not an MI and we could consider and arrange some discharge planning. Uh, whereas uh, the positive predictive value is something different. So positive predictive value means the troponin is positive. Is it a MI? Is it only MI? Uh, that is not necessarily has to be very high in uh, highly sensitive troponin because there are other causes for uh, positive troponins like, uh, you know, uh, myocardial injury due to various other reasons. So most important thing is it has a very high negative predictive value uh, for uh, myocardial infarction. That means if the test is negative, if you follow the protocol, you can safely rule out myocardial infarction. That's what we aim with highly sensitive troponins plus uh, to make early diagnosis, early risk stratification, and also to uh, plan out early discharge planning. So it may overdiagnose few patients with um, uh, myocardial infarctions, sorry, overdiagnose few patients as myocardial infarctions where the troponin rise may be due to other causes. That is okay. Uh, what we really aim is a higher negative predictive values. Now, what we have in our hospital is a zero to three hour algorithm, but there are certain kits which specify zero to one hour algorithm and zero to two hour algorithms, which are used in other countries. So we talked about ECG and troponins as investigations. What are the other tools which we could use in uh, uh, the acute and emergency department is bedside echocardiography. 
because we could appreciate certain regional wall motion abnormalities. So if your patient has, you know, comes with chest pain, history is very suggestive, your ECG is normal, because the patient presents very early within half an hour, you're still worried, is, is it a STEMI? One thing you can do is to repeat the ECG in half an hour. And the other thing you can do is to arrange for an inpatient echocardiogram, where you would look for regional wall abnormalities, trying to establish early diagnosis. It is also extremely useful, uh, the echocardiogram, in those with hemodynamic instability, because you can assess the LV function and see whether that is the cause for the hemodynamic instability. You can pick up complications in certain patients with MI, you get uh, papillary muscle ruptures, ventricular septal defects, you can make early diagnosis for the cause for the uh, instability. And you can pick up other causes for chest pain, like aortic dissections, pulmonary embolism also, uh, by echocardiogram. So it's very important if your patient is unstable. Also very important when your regional wall motion abnormalities may be helpful to make early diagnosis, especially when the ECG is normal or um, when there's clinical doubt persists. It's very important all these patients while you do the diagnostic evaluation are monitored for rhythm because they could at any time be develop abnormal cardiac rhythm resulting in life losses. So you have to monitor them with ECG. And those who find the ECG is normal, the troponin is normal, we could do um, uh, further, you know, restratification with uh, some tests. Uh, in our country, we have the exercise ECG, but in the developed world, they are, where they are do stress imaging, you know, either a stress echocardiogram or a myocardial perfusion imaging or a stress MRI uh, to restratify these patients uh, with, uh, you know, negative troponins and a normal ECG. Uh, CT coronary is another tool, if available, which could be used in these patients to uh, see whether they have coronary artery disease. So we've talked a lot about acute coronary syndrome because that's the most commonest. Let's look at some of the other killers which could present with chest pain where early diagnosis would be very helpful to save patients. So this clinical scenario is a 61-year-old female, four-day history of shortness of breath and cough and chest tightness. She's tachycardic, pulse rate of 120, and the blood pressure a little low aside, 90 by 60 millimeters of mercury. Saturation is a little lower. So what is the diagnosis that you would think of? Look at the ECG, patient is tachycardic. And if you look at the lead one, S wave in one. There's a small Q wave in lead three, T inversions in lead three. So you get the S1, S1, Q3, T3 pattern, patient tachycardic. So what diagnosis comes to your mind? It is most likely that this patient has pulmonary embolism. When you do the echocardiogram, you would find appearance like this. This is your right ventricle, right side. So this, that's the right ventricle, that's the right atrium. So this is your right heart and that's your left heart. So you would find the right heart is enlarged than the left side, indicating some raised pulmonary pressures. It was CT pulmonary angiogram, you would find that's your main pulmonary artery and the branches and filling defects in the CT pulmonary angiogram. So the diagnosis, pulmonary embolism. So, any other uh, sinister diagnosis that would be interested in making? Look at this patient, 72 year old male, background hypertension, present with severe tearing pain in the back of the chest of four hour duration, associated with weakness of the left side of the body. And you hear early diastolic murmur. So it's a hypertension, severe tearing pain in the back of the chest, four hour duration. So most patients would describe in this type of a situation, you know, that's one of the patients. Oh, that type of a pain. So look at the x-ray. You can appreciate a wider mediastinum in this patient, wider mediastinum. And you do a CT iotogram. That's your iota, descending iota, you would find true lumens, true lumen and a false lumen. So this patient has a aortic dissection. Again, this is a trans esophageal echocardiogram, uh, echocardiogram showing true lumen and the false lumen. So this patient has an aortic 
dissection. So aortic dissections are classified as type Stanford type A and B. A is involving ascending aorta. B is confined to descending aorta. Again, uh, you have in this patient, you have a bimodal distribution. Some patients could have dissections at young age when they have connective tissue disorders like Marfan syndromes or even in pregnancies. And again, you get another uh, peak with patients coming a bit older, mostly due to hypertension related changes presenting with aortic dissection. So they have ripping, tearing pain in most situations associated with neurological symptoms because dissection tracts will spread uh, onto the branches, especially when there's carotid involvement, you get uh, the neurological symptoms and you get asymmetrical pulses because the subclavian arteries are occluded. Uh, you know, one side you have the pulse, other side you have the weak pulse or there's a delay in uh, pulses. Those are the clinical features that you would appreciate in that situation. So in this scenario, a 51 year old male had severe vomiting after a binge of alcohol and suddenly developed following vomiting, suddenly developed central chest pain and shortness of breath. And you do x-ray, you would find this. A large left-sided pleural effusion. So what is the diagnosis that you, it comes to your mind? Following boards of vomiting, this patient has developed shortness of breath, chest pain, and a left-sided uh, pleural effusion. This, this patient likely to be having uh, 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 esophageal rupture, esophageal rupture. Um, this is another lady that we are going to present. So this is a, twin, this is a patient who came to my clinic, um, outpatient uh, consultations, so a 26 year old fa female, two day history of right side chest pain, shortness of breath and cough on bending. So this happened about a month ago. Do you have the video clip to present? So that, that's the history of the patient, which I had about a couple of months. Um, so patient comes with a two days to have right side, just pain, bit of shortness of breath, uh, quite ambulate, quite mobile, and had cough on bending. So when we did the x-ray, and you would find this, uh, a massive... Um, right-sided uh, pneumothorax. So this is not an uncommon presentation. Usually I see about a patient or a two uh, every year. So there are about six, seven cases um, detected who just come for consultation because of some um, chest pain um, and was diagnosed to have pneumothorax. So um, chest pain is a medical emergency. So these are the salient things or key messages that I want to convey. It's a medical emergency and do not relax until the bad six, ones, six are excluded. ECG is urgent and very important. And more importantly, a single normal ECG will not exclude acute chronic syndrome. So you seek uh, either expert, advertise, uh, sorry, expert um, uh, advice and also repeat another ECG if the history is suggestive. Uh, continue, continue to monitor the hemodynamics of the patients and you do your biomarkers or your troponins and consider imaging uh, rationally and seek expert advice whenever necessary. So then we are going to move to the second part of the our lecture. So we are going to just to make a superficial um, uh, uh, discussion on this uh, prevention of ischemic heart disease and the recent change in guidelines. So to prevent ischemic heart disease, we need to minimize risk factors. Certain risk factors we cannot eliminate because your age, gender, the family history, history, the genetics, you cannot modify. However, we could modify our behaviors and also certain metabolic risk factors. So behaviors like smoking, you know, your diet, um, your sedentary lifestyle could, could be modified to minimize the risk. Similarly, your diabetes, hypertension, um, and hyperlipidemia could be managed better to reduce this risk. 
so with regard to diet the the, the key message is to uh, especially for the south asian would be to reduce the carbohydrate intake because our diet patterns are quite rich in carbohydrate intake so we have to have a bit more the fiber content in the diet having more vegetables more leaves and more protein content and to reduce carbohydrate as well as a saturated fat content in the diet so this is uh, another picture of a sri lankan diet so here you would find that the, the carbohydrate content has been reduced and you have a lot of leaves and vegetables and bit of fish the proteins in the diet so so you have to modify mainly to reduce the carbohydrate content also to uh, reduce the saturated fat content in the diet and to increase the um, uh, fiber content uh, and the nutrient content of the diet so with regard to exercise what they recommend is at least to do you know half an hour to one hour of a moderate intensity exercise like you know having a brisk walk on most days of the week and also to try and reduce your weight to keep the bmi in the range of 20 to 25 uh, to minimize the risk so other behavior which increase the risk is smoking and uh, by two to three fold the cardiovascular risk is increased with smoking so smoking cessation is another behavior that we could uh, try and enforce. So management of dyslipidemia is what we are going to discuss next. So let's look at a clinical scenario. You find a 65 year old chap with elevated blood pressure 160 by 80 and smokes regularly, has this lipid profile, total cholesterol 175, LDS 110, HDL 32. What is the best way to manage lipids? What is the best way? The LDL is not very high. Are we going to leave him alone? Or are we going to do something else? Key management of dyslipidemia now is to do a 10-year-old cardiovascular risk estimation. That is of very great importance. So 10-year CV risk means the 10-year risk of dying from a cardiovascular event. How do we quantify? There are systems or tools, different tools which can be used. So this is one of the systems, the score system. Uh, it assesses the risk of a 10-year risk of a first fatal atherovascular event. So you do it by using certain charts, by using the patient's age, sex, the smoking habits, uh, and the total cholesterol value and the systolic blood pressure value and you grade them as very high risk if the 10-year risk is over 10 percent high risk if it's five to ten percent between five to ten percent moderate risk one to five percent and low risk if that is less than one percent this is to manage your cholesterol and different uh, tools are there score system is just one of the tools so these are the system uh, you know charts uh, for each populations um, you can use those this is for european population at high risk of cardiovascular disease and the, those with low risk, you can find another chart. And there are different charts to use for this purpose. For South Asians or, or Asians rather, uh, the South Asians, the, the risk needs to be multiplied by a factor of 1.4 to quantify our risk because we are a bit more high prevalent population for these events. Um, apart from score system, there are other score systems. So if you just uh, type 10 year cardiovascular risk in your smartphone, you should be able to enter the patient data and within a minute, you should be able to get an idea about what the 10 year risk of your patient. So you don't have to buy hat and carry these charts or, or remember certain figures. You can just do it with your smartphone and calculate the 10 year cardiovascular risk. So if your 10 year risk is, you know, the, the machine says, you know, the, the, your, the screen says your 10 year risk is more than 10%, you are very high risk. 5 to 10 percent high risk 1 to 5 moderate risk less than 1 low risk but in patient with diabetes in patients who have very high cholesterol like familial hyperlipidemia in those with ckd we are not going to use these tools because automatically by the presence of diabetes you fall in certain high risk categories so if your diabetes is over two years uh, sorry over 20 years or if you have you know target organ damage like nephropathy or retinopathy or whatever you anyway fall in very high risk category if your diabetes is 10 to 20 years no target organ damage still you are in the high risk category and if your diabetes is less than 10 years no target organ damage you are in the moderate risk 
So similarly, if you have very high cholesterol with another risk factor like hypertension, you are in the very high risk. If you have familial hyperlipidemia, even without any risk factors, you are still in the high risk. Similarly, CKD stage four beyond, very high risk category. CKD stage three, you are in the high risk category. So if you have any one of these diabetes, familial hyperlipidemia, CKD, you don't have to do a tool to calculate the risk. You are automatically falling in one of these categories in those with other patients with you know hyper uh, sorry hypertension smoking uh, and etc we are going to use these tools and calculate and categorize them into different categories so your management for dyslipidemia would depends on which category that you would fall into or your portion would patient would fall into so these are the targets uh, that you would uh, consider in treating these patients so if your patient falls in a very high risk category, you know, 10 year is more than 10%, you want to keep this cholesterol below 55 milligrams per deciliter, very low level. If your patients fall in high risk category, you want to keep it below 70. Moderate LDL less than 100. So these are the LDL targets that we want to go. So if in low risk category, still you want to keep it a bit low than 116 milligrams per deciliter. So this will eventually tell us, you know, most of the patient probably would need to be on a statin as, as, as time goes on, isn't it? The guidelines have been made more stringent, you know, the criteria has been more strict. So, uh, uh, however, in these low and moderate risk categories, if your cholesterol is higher than these targets, you could initially try some lifestyle modification alone and see whether you reach the particular targets. Uh, and if that target is not reached, then you obviously will have to treat them and get these cholesterol levels below these uh, low targets. Whereas in the more high risk and the very high risk groups, uh, we usually don't wait much with lifelong uh, intervention. We usually try to treat them a bit early and to get these cholesterol LDL level down to these very low levels specified. So what... Uh, treatment are we go going to use to reduce cholesterol to this level? So you get your uh, card, uh, do your cardiovascular risk assessment and get the cholesterol level and see whether they are above the our treatment lines. If they are above our treatment line, we are going to start treating with a high dose statin and get the cholesterol Amma. level down to the desired level. Amma. And if we have not got the LDL treatment target. If we have not reached that LDL cholesterol target on um, high dose statin, then we are going to add acetamide as second line option. Again, we are going to check the cholesterol. If that is not reached, we are going to use an expensive medication called PCSK9 inhibitor, which are monoclonal antibodies, not freely available in our setup. So, however, for our patients, we could try high dose statin. If that is not working, we could add on top of that, we could add acetamide and reach our targets. So going back to the scenario, 65 year old chap, we talk hypertension smoking and this moderately, you know, uh, moderate cholesterol levels. What is the best way to manage? So if you look at this chart, he's 65 years, he's a male and he's a smoker blood pressure 160, so he would fall in this category, 10 year risk of 18%. So for that patient, he falls in the very high risk category. So for that patient, so the LDL target should be below 55. So it's highly likely that this patient would benefit from a high dose statin therapy. So it's not that we are going to look at, you know, lipid profile and do a arbitrary judgment about whether to give statin or not. We have to do a 10 year risk assessment for that you don't have to carry charts or you know remember figures you just can use your smartphone just calculate you know mention uh, do a search 10 year cardiovascular risk the tools will automatically will appear on your phone and you do uh, enter the data age sex smoking etc and the lipid profile levels then automatically that will tell the patient's 10 year risk so you can decide whether to give a statin or not so talking about you know Hypertension, uh, again, the guidelines have differed a little bit. So, the, you know, we, we diagnose hypertension when the pressure is more than 140, 90. 
however the cardiovascular risk start to uh, go up from values as low as 120 80 from this level if the pressures go up the cardiovascular risk gradually start tracking up so optimal bp actually would be below 120 80 however we diagnose hypertension when the pressure is over more than 140 90 so bp just above this optimal value, we call it the normal value up to 130. These are the ESC guidelines. The American guidelines nomenclature is a bit different. Up to 130, you call it the normal value. Up to 84, you call it again the normal value. So beyond uh, 130 to 140, we call it high normal. Again, 85 to 90, we call it high normal. So above 140, up to you know 160, we call stage one and the diastolic value up to 99 from 90 we call stage one stage two is above 160 up to 180 and the diastolic up to you know 110 we call it stage two beyond 180 or 110 diastolic we call it the stage three so there are there are different classification this is the esc classification which they use so nowadays the practice is you know when the pressure is more than 149 to start treatment and to get it at least to 138 in almost all patients. And in younger patients, you know, those below 65 years, it is recommended to lower down the pressures even further, provided they tolerate the medications. So you would try and reach a goal close to 120, 120 to 130 is your target for younger patients. Older patients, you know, above 65, uh, you would try to get to 130 and 80 range. Um, and uh, there's a 10 now even to uh, patients with you know 130 to 140 range you start treatment if they fall in the very high risk uh, cardiovascular risk categories um, that is also enforced uh, that is also recommended uh, because now guidelines have uh, you know uh, made a move you know for cholesterol to try much lower cholesterol level as well as for pressure also there uh, the direction is that to target much lower value the diastolic BP target should be less than 80 for all hypertensive patients. And also in addition to um, you know, hypertension, management of the diabetes is also very important, uh, aiming at ideal um, HPA1C targets of less than seven. So what is the role of aspirin in primary prevention? Now aspirin, obviously is an antiplatelet agent it will lower the cardiovascular risk however the concerns of aspirin for primary prevention is debatable in most situations because of the associated side effects especially gi bleeding so whereas in secondary prevention those who already had a cardiovascular event there is no doubt about its benefits for primary prevention the, its role is quite limited uh, so at present, the ESC guideline would only endorse aspirin as primary prevention for diabetes patients with a high or very high risk. It may be considered provided the breeding is strong. The American guidelines, little bit more relaxed, again, still only for patients in 40 to 70 between age group, not very old, uh, with a higher cardiovascular risk, they could uh, they have endorsed to use aspirin provided that there is no high risk of bleeding um, uh, as primary prevention. So limited role uh, in very high risk categories or diabetes, not very old, uh, it may be used provided that there is no excess bleeding risk. I think I'll be, I'm concluding my presentation with that uh, uh, input. So we have completed our lecture in about an hour and thank you for your patience and i'm happy to answer any questions if there are any questions remaining thank you so much sir, for the excellent presentation uh, there are a few queries from our participants uh, the first question was uh, what was the cause for the 20 year old female with pneumothorax and what was your management? Yeah, um, so, so uh, management, management for that patient, patient would uh, include um, uh, uh, immediate insertion of a uh, intercostal drainage, you know, IC tube, and then followed up by specialist referral to decide whether uh, he need um, 
uh, any further management with regard to that to prevent future recurrence. So most of these patients have primary, you know, without a specific goal, a primary spontaneous pneumothorax where you don't find a specific cause. But uh, certain patients, you know, we refer to specialized centers uh, like, you know, Valisera, and then sometimes they undergo pleuro, uh, pleurectomy or sometimes pleurodesis. Um, and most of these patients we, which I encountered in my clinical practice had the primary, you know, spontaneous pneumothorax where there is no specific course. I had quite a few, you know, university students, um, uh, mostly females, but sometimes occasionally males also. Yes, sir. Uh, the next, next question from uh, Dinesh, Dr. Dinesh is in private practice, are there any chance of missing of unstable angina because of troponin and ECG both are normal? Then what is the indication to send the patient to hospital with suspected unstable yeah. angina? Again, um, I yeah. would like to yeah. reiterate one fact because uh, most of, if your patient comes after chest pain, you know, and comes after six hours, the, the, it's very easy. If the patient is, you know, pain free, and the time of six hours is uh, gone through, because most of the in our private sector we don't have highly sensitive troponin. We have the conventional troponin available. So if the patient comes after six hours, highly sensitive, sorry, the the conventional troponin is negative. You could be a bit, little bit more relaxed. Uh, whereas if the patient presents within six hours and you ha don't have the highly sensitive troponin, you have only the conventional troponin in your prior, you know, outpatient settings, then you are in a bit of a dilemma. So you have to use your judgment in evaluating the chest pain. So if my patient is a pain who has comes with, you know, pain lasted half an hour, say he comes to with a two hour history of a chest pain and the pain lasted one hour, you know, central retrosternal pain or a pain in the jaw area or something like that with compatible with acuconary syndrome, um, then I probably would send him to the hospital because um, I haven't got the highly sensitive troponin on one part. Other thing, the clinical evaluation, you know, suggests this is probably an ACS. So then I would send him to the hospital um, um, based on my clinical judgment. So more than the troponin and the ECG, I would use, you know, if the patient, you know, comes with that particular history, I would sometimes might even start antiplatelet therapy. It's all about your clinical judgment about the history, which is more important. If your patient, you know, comes with chest pain, you know, pointed to one area, was on breathing, not typical, and the low risk profile, young patient, no diabetes, no hypertension, I'm a little more relaxed. I will ask them to do a troponin about six hours, send me a WhatsApp message or whatever I would manage because in my judgment, that is less likely to be ACS. If you, my judgment is, you know, my first priority is ACS, then I probably would send him to hospital so that they could do further stratification in the hospital. Thank you, sir. Uh, the next question is, sir, what is the place for pacing in a patient with staying with complete heart block? Uh, good question. Uh, good so question. Get, uh, yeah. with, uh, with, uh, Especially with Especially anterior with stimulation, stimulation, you can have complete heart block. There are three mechanisms. The first the mechanism first is increased vagal tone. Because the patient is in you know, stressful situation, you get increased vagal tone. Uh, the second possibility is um, the nodal eddy. AV naught can become ischemic and become edematous. The third possibility is infarction of the AV naught. The third possibility is infarction. Most of the time, when the patient has a STEMI and comes immediately, the heart block is due to increase. So when you so give atropine, the tone then... is cut off and the heart block improves. If it doesn't improve on atropine, you give atropine, doesn't improve, you repeat it again, doesn't improve. And after your thrombolysis tend to persist, sometimes you may use also. So if it tend to persist, then the trend next you suspect, okay, it's maybe a bit of ischemic edema of the AV naught and it's not responding to our uh, atropine because it's not due to vagal tone. Then you would send him for temporary pacing. So they do a temporary pacing and keep the patient on the temporary patient for a week or so. Still, it's not uh, the patient is pacemaker dependent on the temporary pacemaker not coming out. You suspect, okay, it's not due to edema. If it's due to edema, it would have now subsided and the patient should have been able to be weaned off the TPM. Now it's probably infarction of the AV now, then you consider permanent pacing. Thank you, sir, for the excellent uh, explanation. Uh, the next question is, uh, how do we assess the need for statins in a patient less than 40 years? 
as the charge mostly assess uh, persons over 30, 40 years. Well, you can again, uh, well, you can again uh, use your tools. You, know, sure. you can, there are a score system is one of the tools. I think, yes, the, the charts would also tell us, I mean, uh, uh, if you go back to some of my, you know, do online chart score system, I mean, even for younger patients, it does specify the, the chart does specify it. And you can use your smartphone tools also, just 10 year cardiovascular risk, you should be able to get it. All right, so thank you. And one more question. Uh, once we achieve the targets of LDL, should we continue the statins for lifelong? Extremely good question. So very often uh, we find patients, you know, high lipids uh, started by statin by a GP. A few months time, the patients are asked to do a lipids and lipids are normal. The patients comes off the statin and never gets, you know, a follow up visit. No, then never doesn't get a follow up, another review with the lipid profile. So it's, it's all about, you know, maintaining the low cholesterol level on the long run. That is the most important because if you're just going to treat him for two, three months, you are not going to lower his cardiovascular rate get it lower and maintain that lower level for that uh, for longer duration. So it's very important that you continue with your statin therapy. Uh, so even if you want, if the patient is very keen on beaning off the statin, I mean, it should be done in a monitored manner where, you know, patient who is waiting, you know, weighing 80 kilos, gradually lose his weight. Now the weight is, you know, 60 kilos or 55 kilos over a few years. You may be able to, you know, gradually reduce the statin if your lipids are in the ideal range. But unless something like that happens, uh, I think we should always, you know, keep continue on the statin and monitor the statin, lipid profiles. Thank you, sir. The next question is, uh, is there any correlation between troponin eye levels and reperfusion? Yes, reperfusion, yes, uh, the troponin level tend to go up after a reperfusion. It's one of the things where you would use to assess the success of the reperfusion. So uh, troponin anyway is going to go up over time. But if you reperfuse, the troponin level, uh, the rise is quite rapid. So it can be used. I mean, it's not that practically we are using. We are mostly on clinical setup is relying on the, the ST resolution and the resolution of the pain of the patient. Those are the two things that we would uh, use to assess the success of the reperfusion. Uh, but uh, this is another thing which is not practical to use in most clinical setup in our country to assess success of reperfusion, but can be used. Thank you, sir. One more question. Uh, without thrombolytic treatment, can chest pain with ST elevation and high troponin, uh, I, troponin I title resolve without Q wave formation? Yes, yes. it can. Uh, because, uh, because your, your body, body has a mechanism. Now, now you have a thrombus formation. Your body has a natural way of uh, thrombolysis also. So very occasionally we would find, you know, you get ST elevation before the, when the patient, you know, at the ETU, when the patient comes to the cath lab or to the cardiac and the ST has resolved without any, you know, uh, thrombolytic being used. It's called automatically the body has mechanism, but it's often it doesn't work alone. But in a very small percentage of patient, you find the vessel is occluded. Now, a uh, small, uh, you know, channel has opened up, the ST has come down. But uh, the management of the patient would not differ. I mean, uh, if the patient needs an angiogram, we should go ahead and do it. Uh, Thank you, sir. One more practical question. In peripheral hospitals, we do not have trop file. So if the history is suggestive of uh, or the ECG changes are normal, uh, if the history is suggestive of MI and the ECG changes are normal before uh, getting the trop file levels, is it okay to give the emergency medications and transfer the patient? I think the so. Stator? I think so. I think so. If the history is suggestive, there is no allergies in the patient. There is no allergies. I mean, even if the patient has a bit of gastritis, giving a bit of a, you know, antiplatelet therapy will not make a big difference. I mean, it's, it would be much worse clinical scenario to, you know, not to treat an acute coronary syndrome. The adverse outcome would be more. So if, if your history is suggestive, I would suggest, you know, exclude allergies, treat the patient. Uh, you know, give the necessary medication and you transfer the patient for further, you know, troponin evaluation, restratification, it is easy. To... Thank you, sir. One more question. Uh, what could be the reason for hemodynamically instability of a patient who treated with cardiac pacing for inferior stenting with complete heart block after four hours? So I think it is. So uh, what could be the reason for the hemodynamically instability of a patient who treated with cardiac pacing 
for inferior STEMI with complete hard work after four hours. Yeah, I think most, I think if most the inferior is STEMI is unstable, um, hard block is one of the reasons for unstability. But if the patient is spaced, I would mostly think of RV infarct because inferior STEMI can be associated with RV infarct and uh, that could have a catastrophic outcome. The mortality is going to be higher. Um, so uh, mostly that patient probably would have had an RV infarct because of a proximal right coronary artery occlusion. Thank you, sir. I think the last question is going to be for a diagnosed patient with hypertension for long term, yeah. having BP around 90 by 50 during recent visits uh, with the lowest dose of hypertensive medications, is there a possibility of stopping the medication? Yeah, BP yeah. of 90, 90 by 50. Yeah, yeah. Th that definitely need to be stopped because the, the lowest, uh, the guidelines recommend the lowest value we, we should tolerate is 120. So if pay, pay pressure is up to 120, I would accept uh, the, if the patient is tolerating well. But uh, below 120, then I would definitely consider either reducing the dose or stopping the medication and monitor, but monitoring the patient after that. Uh, uh, thank you so much, sir. That's all the questions for today. And here we are concluding our session. And before that, uh, I would like to thank Dr. Amila Walavatu for his excellent and informative presentation on behalf of the GMO and Society for Health Research and Innovation. Also, uh, we would like to present a talk of appreciation uh, to Dr. Amila Walavatu. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you again. And uh, thank you all for your participation. Uh, have a good day. and. Be